message today is, is that the battle belongs to the Lord. And two weeks ago, I, I preached on hope, and I was talking about the meaning of hope, and I was bringing out the Hebrew and the Greek. And um, this morning, I'm going to talk, talk English. And I don't have much Greek, and I don't have much Hebrew, so I hope I can convey this message to you properly. But if the battle belongs to the Lord, then why are you waging war? Every season of your life is going to bring a new battle. And it's up to you to decide whether that battle belonged to the Lord or didn't. Or you're going to take it. Or you're going to run with it. And I kept hearing this song that Phil Wickham song, Battle Belongs, and I woke up one morning, two, we- two weeks ago, and just started singing the song. I'm thinking, why am I singing this song? And So I started praying about it. You know, didn't hear like, this is your next sermon. But then I heard my wife singing the song. And then I came into the office and I heard Dawson singing the song. <laughs> and then I'm like, what are you trying to say, Lord? And so I looked and I, I was, you know, I was just looking up, you know, the scriptures of battle belongs to the Lord. And um, I found myself, if you guys want to turn to Second Chronicles, uh, King Jehoshaphat, uh, chapter 20. Um, I found this, I found this prayer and I think that he did it right. And uh, if you look at that, you know, the, Chapters are often labeled, and this, it says Jehoshaphat's prayer. And uh, I find it super powerful, uh, what he did. Um, You know, the Old Testament is like having children. Um, It's it's war everywhere. I was just, like, just reading one chapter, and I'm thinking, like, all these clans are coming against the, you know, king of Judah, and... This is like, what's like to have children? Like, raising, you know, we just were on a two day adventure back from Orlando. And every once in a while, my wife and I had to say, Kids, can you just, just be quiet for a second? Just, just, you know what I'm talking about. Leon, you know what I'm talking about. He's silent right now back there. And something's wrong. You know what I'm saying. I had to, you know, kind of gain my composure and, okay. But as I was reading this, I was thinking, what a powerful, what a powerful way to deal with the situation, okay? So I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but it starts out with the, the, the Moabites, the Ammonites, you know, the, the Meunites, they came against Jehoshaphat for battle. It said, some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, Later on, it says, And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the, new, uh, before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. And they lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword of judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house. So if you are the temple, it's your house. What are you claiming over your life? So Amy just got up here and said, I want you to walk through me, with me through this scripture. Let's proclaim this over our lives. What are you proclaiming over your life? You know, eh, this thing here is the rudder of the ship. You're, you're, where are you steering? Where are you going? What are you saying? You know, they say that words have vibrations in the air and they're powerful. It's so powerful, the things that you speak over your life. What are the things that you're speaking over your children? 
This Wednesday night, what are the things that we're going to speak around the table? I, uh, <clears throat> we run a homeschool group, and uh, we, were in, um, we were in what they call a practicum, and um, they do one every year for training purposes. And I remember sitting there, and we were around this table, <clears throat> and we were in this portion where it was, you know, somebody telling us what we're, what we're doing, and they ask questions. And, you know, this one lady, she had to send her kids back to, back to high school and public school, and she didn't want to, but she was in the middle of this, like, really messy divorce. And so I was like, I was feeling so bad for her. And out of, from the corner of this table, this lady just starts saying, you're doing the wrong thing, and you got to do this. you got to pull them back. And it's like, okay, we get it, you know. But so... If you know, like, the homeschool communities, it's, it's really like a lot of moms, not too many dads. So I have this amazing privilege of being this dad in the middle of this mom fest. <laughs> and um, the lady that, I mean that in the nicest way, it, I, the conversation is pretty heated and kind of comes to an end, and the, the, the host of the meeting says, does anybody have anything else they want to share? So I raise my hand. I go, I'd like to share something. And she goes, oh, what, what would you like to say? I said, well, I said, listen, I graduated from public school. I was in Christian school, and I was homeschooled. I was like, but the one thing that really helped me through it all was sitting around the table at dinner time with my parents asking me what I learned. So I was telling this lady and trying to give this lady hope and telling her, listen, it's up to you. It's not up to some school, not up to a Christian school, not up to any school. It's up to you. These are your kids. What are you pouring into their life? Ask them. No matter what school they're part of, ask them, what are you learning? What are you learning? What are you pulling away with? My wife directs, and I'm a tutor. I still ask these questions to my children. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing in Miss Mel's class? We trust you, Mel. Aunt Evie. We trust our tutor. We trust our teachers. but, But you hear what I'm saying? It's about us being highly involved with our kids, pouring into our kids, speaking over our kids. What do you want to be? What do you want to do? I remember my mom, my dad, they both asked me at different times, what do, you, what do you want? It's so important. So important. Mom, I never wanted this position. I never said pastor, did I? I was, I was a chiropractor, that's what I wanted to do, yeah. And I found out that I wanted to go to Cuca College, and I found out at the time like it was like an all-girls school or something, or there was an all-girl, I don't know what it was. And I was like, that's the one I want to go to, and they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> Sorry, that was a raw moment. So anyway, verse 13 here. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord. Sorry. With their little ones, their wives, and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon someone with all these names. And he said in verse 15, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at the great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, you will uh, come up against the, uh, the ascent of Ziz, for you, uh, you will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. He's telling them even where they're going to be. And they don't have to do anything. He just told them, you don't have to do anything. You know, it said that King Jehoshaphat fell on his face. Fell on his face before God and began to pray. 
and began to say those things that I read a little while ago. This was your land. You gave this to your children. This was, these are things that you've promised us. I talked two weeks ago about hope and how it's not something that we were wishing upon a star or something. It's something, we have expectation in our lives. We have an expectation, not just a hope, not just, not just a, a, a glimpse of something, but if you have a prophetic word in your life, I was telling you, grab a hold of that prophetic word and ride with it. I'm about to get to that here. Where does it say? Right there, verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. That's it. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were, uh, who were to sing to the, to the Lord and praise him in holy attire. And they went before the army and, uh, and say, give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. Then you go on to read the whole thing. He, they did nothing. They did nothing. He prayed. He sought the Lord for direction and security. Followed the words of the prophet. Just before, in, late, in the beginning of that chapter, the prophet prophesied. Said you're going to win. You don't have to do anything. So now let's take that into your Application Now, how are you going to apply that to your life? What are you going to do? See, the one reason why I want to get into some more dialogues with you guys on Wednesday nights is because I want to hear from you. I want, I want to know what's going on in you. What's, how, how can we help? Or how can you help me? I have battles. I fight battles every day sometimes, you know, and then it's like, no, Lord, this is, you, you've assigned, you know, I have to turn to God and say, no, Lord, you've assigned me to do this. If you've assigned me to do this, you're going to give me everything that I need to complete my job. So in your life, he's given you everything that you need to do and all the tools, all the gifts to complete your work. Now, let's take gifting and all that stuff aside. You're a human. You have a spirit. Kavaring with God, entwined with God's spirit. Give the battle over. So, but then once you give the battle over, what do you do? What does that look like? Walking in victory. We just sang it. Walking in victory. But what happens? What happens is distractions. Distraction after distraction after distraction after distraction. Can we read Matthew 6? Matthew 6, where was I, verse 20, 25? Matthew 6, verse 25. Now, this is, this, is one of the, this is one of the big ones about worrying, but there's so many other distractions that we run into, you know? We can, we can let our children be a distraction. We can let our spouses be a distraction. You hear what I'm saying? Like there's many things in our lives we can make, we can, we can let our work become distraction. Verse 25 of Matthew 6, this is why I tell you never to be worried about your life for all that you need will be provided such as food, water, clothing, everything your body needs. Isn't there more to life than a meal? Isn't, more, isn't uh, your body more than clothing? 
Consider the birds. Do you think they worry about their existence? They don't plant or reap or store up food, yet your heavenly Father provides them each with food. Aren't you more valuable to your Father than they? So which one of you, by worrying, could add anything to your life? And this is one of the main things that people do. They, they worry about their lives. I love that. Not that they worry, but this, what it says. Aren't you much more valuable to your father than they? So now, what is that talking about? Just the, this, this, this food part. It's talking about your value. How do you value yourself? What type of value are you putting on yourself? I've had many, many discussions with Mr. Mike Teed over here. He values himself. As a businessman and a salesman, he puts his stuff out there on the line. He's told me how he's worked through different conversations with people. It, and it's, it's not even about the money. It's about your value. Because you know when you put value on yourself then everything else follows, right? I mean, as soon as you value yourself and you realize who you are and what you've done, now all of a sudden you have to real think, now bring the gifts back in. What are those gifts in your lives? Value the gift. Value yourself. It's part of you. It's part of what you do. Verse 28, and why would you worry about your clothing? Ladies, I just spent some time at the mall in Orlando. You know what, though? My wife and my children were not worried. They weren't worried at all. I had this little guy right here. I was just transferring money. I was worried. They weren't worried. They just decided, we're, you know, my main goal when we got to Florida, I told Ava, was I'm keeping you out of every H&M store. That's what I'm doing. That's my goal while we're in Florida. No H&M. Well, of course, Aunt Evie finds one. I think it might be the biggest in the U.S. I don't know. But she finds one, and Ava goes to town. Worried about nothing and grabbing everything. Yeah, look what I found. Are you sure you don't have more money? As I thought about that this morning, I thought about how I don't have to worry about what I ha I'm going to wear. And I began to think about my value how God sees me. And I am his son. And it's not my job to worry about the battle because if the battle belongs to him, then I need to walk a victorious life because he doesn't lose. Yeah, that's right. Maybe you can say, God doesn't lose. God doesn't lose. That means you don't lose. That means you've won. The battle belongs to the Lord. You walk in victory. And you have to remind yourself. When they were buying clothes, I had to remind myself, I walk in victory. I might have to transfer some money, but that's okay. Money's there to spend. Right? Men? Wow, it's like, girls are like, yes, it is. Money's there to spend. Guys are like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm a spender, though, so it's opposite with me. I'm a spender. She's not. I just happen to not like H&M clothing. So it's <laughs> but she does, and she's in the get-up here. So look at the beautiful flowers of the field. They don't work or toil. And yet even Solomon, in all of his splendor, was robed in beauty like one of those, or not even Solomon in all of his splendor was robed in beauty like one of these. 
So if God has clothed the meadow with hay, which is, which is here for you, such a short time and then dried up and burned, won't he provide for you the clothes you need? You of little faith. So then, forsake your worries. Why would you say, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For that is what the unbelievers chase after. I don't know if that just shot chills down your spine, but it did me. That's what the unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your heavenly father already know the things your bodies require? So above all, consistently seek God's kingdom. Maybe you can say consistently. So above all, consistently seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. I love how the passion puts that. All these less important things. God's going, he goes, I, get, I have all your food. I have all your clothes. I, I know what you're going to, I know all these things. Value yourself. You know, how good is it? Lady, look, all three of you sitting there with clothes from H&M. Yeah, we're going back to this. I'm going back to this. I'm not sore, Okay. I'm not sore. No, I got more money to spend on you guys. You know. But how good does it make you feel to be in a new outfit? Is it good? I mean, what is it about that? Like, you're, just like, you're in that shirt. Dawson, you're smirking too much back there. You know I'm not lying. You feel good right Look, Look, his hands are behind his head. He's chilling in his sweater. That's what he's doing. And the Lord's looking at these things, going, yeah, I gave that to you. I gave that to you. I gave that to you. Yep, that money in your pocket, I gave that to you. To spend on those clothes, to make you feel good about yourself. He wants you to feel good about yourself. He wants you to have the food and the clothes. He wants you to have all the things. He just says they're less important. So all you have to do is set some of those things down. I don't serve my clothes. I don't serve my money. My money serves me because that's what God gave me because I serve God. And when I can put the things in order. Consistently, constantly seek the kingdom. Don't stop seeking kingdom. Don't stop seeking his word. says in verse 34, refuse to worry about tomorrow, but deal with each challenge that comes your way one day at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. You know, that's a big one. That is a really big one. Because I have this thing called a Google Calendar. And if I showed you right now, you would probably get sick. Because there's so much on there. And I tend to, now listen, we have to have order in our lives. That's what it does. You know, I look at it and go, oh, that's what I'm doing today. Right. Okay, I got to do this. I got to go. Oh, it's my birthday. I wonder what my wife's going to do for me. You know, I have this calendar, and it keeps an order in my life, but I don't worry about my calendar. It's there to serve me. It's what it does. The tools are there to serve you. You don't serve the tools. Yeah? But I think one of the biggest things we do is we tend to worry about tomorrow. We tend to keep that, I gotta get, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta just relax. And I think that when you can rest in his peace, we've been on this thing this whole year with encouragement and strength, rest, peace. Isn't it so good? It's so good to know how God thinks about me. Isn't that wonderful? Maybe we could take a second. Okay. Just close your eyes. And just begin to, th to think about how God thinks about you. You can think about the things he's given you.
your abilities, gifting, work, spouse. These are all gifts from God, by the way. These are all things that he brought into your life. Wow. I get so overwhelmed. So the one thing that we have to do, though, in order to live a victorious life is to believe. Do you believe it? I heard one yes. I know, this is like, this is the problem. I'm talking, like, this is like a monologue going on here. Like, a, and, yeah. It's, we have to, we have to believe. So what does it do? So I was listening to this guy the other day. I'm not going to say his name. But I was listening to this guy the other day. And he was saying the problem with belief is in, in the American society and our culture is like that it's, it's we're, we're not using the word right. So I, we've been on this word kick for a long time. So we're not using the word right. And so he said, because if you are to believe, that means that's the way you live your life. Now be, start to think about the way you live your life and what you believe. Is what you believe over here and the way you live your life over here? Or are, are they together? This is for you to think about right now. I was thinking of, like, you look at websites and you see the belief statements. You see, uh, especially with churches, you know, what we believe and, you know, it's, it's so important, it's so crucial. Now, the guy talks a lot about children and families and stuff like that. And, but when he said that, I was like, it's so true. We just don't, we just don't have, we, we just like to use words. And we don't realize how powerful they are. So, what do we believe? In order to live a victorious life, we have to know our identity we preach this all the time. And we walk in it. We walk in it. So I want to challenge you this week, this year, whatever it is, like look at your belief. What do you believe? What is it that you believe that is just ingrained in you, you know? And how are you communicating that? How are you living that? A couple weeks ago I talked about that the whole abstract to concrete concept. It's like the belief in my, in my head is a, it's a great concept, but then I know when I start to live it out, I'm gonna get ridiculed. It's real. And it's like, and I try to weigh those things, and I'm like, eh, do I wanna get picked on, or do I wanna look cool? Well, what do you believe? What do you believe? I want to turn over to Romans 8 in the mirror translation here. Before we go there, I um, just want to reiterate the kicking out of distractions. Kick out the distractions. What's distracting you? Not even just really right now, but in life. What's, what's your distraction? What do you know that's taken up time. It's taken up more time in your life than it should. Just really start to ask yourself those questions. Kick them out. Romans, Romans 8. I believe Big Papa was just there. So Romans 8. Verses 28, meanwhile, we know that the love of God causes everything to mutually contribute to our advantage. This master plan is announced in our original identity. Verse 29, he pre-designed and engineered us from the start to be jointly fashioned in the same mold and image of his son according to the exact blueprint of his thought. Now, that's a place that I go to 
Maybe you could even close your eyes with me. That's a place that I go to when I, in order to kick out distractions, in order to, in, in order to, to lock in with God. I want his thoughts. Just what is said there. He pre-designed and engineered us from the start to be jointly fashioned in the same mold and image as his son, according to the exact blueprint of his thought. So I say, Lord, what are your thoughts for me? What are your thoughts? We see the original and intended pattern of our lives preserved in his son. He is the firstborn from the same womb that reveals our genesis. He confirms that we are the invention of God. I don't know if that changes your thought process either. You are God's invention. Jesus reveals that we pre-existed in God. He defined, he defined us. He rendered us innocent and also adorned us with splendor and esteem. All these, all these things point to one conclusion. God is for us. Who can prevail against us? Maybe you could say that God is for us. Who can prevail against me? Now, how about we take that into our daily walk? Take that into your daily walk. Begin to repeat those things over and over and over in your life. You know, that's why I'm not, I'm not like keen on... Um, I'm, I'm big on deliverance and not so keen on counseling just because the counseling is, is, is like me trying to change you. We were just talking about this in Bible study. It's like the counseling is kind of like me trying to change your thoughts and, and work with you to think differently. And, but a deliverance happens in an instant. You're delivered from something. You're set free. But then there's still, there's still some help. There's still some work there that needs to be done. It's like salvation. It's like, okay, I'm saved. Now what? All your, problem, all your bills just got paid, all these things. Just, no, it's not what happens. It's a lifestyle that you begin to live. It's something that you take on. Yeah. It's your new life. It is. And it begins to change everything. Once you can put those things in order. So who's fighting your battles? Are you? Or is God fighting your battles? Let me read it here just a little bit more. Hmm. Verse 32. The gift of his son is the irrefutable evidence of God's heart towards us. He held nothing in reserve, but freely gave everything we could ever wish to have this is what our joint sonship is all about. Everything we lost in Adam is again restored to us in Christ. Sin left mankind with an enormous shortfall. Grace restores mankind to excellence. Can you say, I've been restored to excellence? That's an awesome start right there. I've been restored to excellence. I don't care what Polly thinks about me. Thank you. I love you, Polly. Or Jake. You know, I've been restored to excellence, man. And when we're restored to excellence and we can think about that and we know God's thoughts and we know the blueprint and we begin to walk it out in lifestyle, isn't that such a beautiful thing? Isn't that what it's all about? And all the gifts and all the things that God has given us, they just come. That's that's easy. The lifestyle is really easy too. But it's about walking. It's about walking in the excellence. It's about being excellent. Because you know you are 
excellent. If God called you excellent, why do you call yourself something else? If God called you his son, why do you call yourself something else? I refuse to call myself anything else. Verse 33, God has identified us. Who can disqualify us? His word is our origin. No one can point a finger. He declared us innocent. I'm just telling you these things because the battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to him. Don't take it back. He's not an Indian giver. He's not going to give it back to you. Well, I guess if you really want it back, he's going to. Don't take it back. What is the battle you're fighting right now? Give it over to him. Give it over to him. Is it a healing you need? Give it over to him. Is it finances you need? Give it over to him. What is it that you need? Now make sure it's, this isn't like a wish list. This isn't Christmas, man. This is, this is Christianity. Yeah. This is who we are. Yeah. God called me excellent, so I'm going to live an excellent life. Yeah. And what does that excellence look like? Why do we always try to define God's excellence? We always try to define the things. We try to, but this is it, and this is it, and it is constantly changing. It's, it's ever eluding us from season to season. We think we got something figured out, and it's like, oh, no, 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 I, want, I had it figured out. Now I gotta move out of my parents' house and go to and rent an apartment. Or now I, what's the season you're in? God wants he knows the season you're in. He just wants to be a part of it. He wants the whole thing. <clears throat> what further ground can there possibly be to condemn mankind? In his death, he faced our judgment. In his resurrection, he reveals our righteousness. The implications cannot be undone. Isn't that good to know? The implications cannot be undone. You cannot undo the work of God. He now occupies the highest seat of authority as the executive of our redemption in the throne room of God. What will it take to distance us from the love of Christ? You name any potential calamity, intense pressure of the worst, kind, uh, worst possible kind, claustrophobia, persecution, destitution, loneliness, ex, you know, enter whatever here. Life-threatening danger or war. Let me quote scripture to remind you. Here's Paul quoting scripture to the Romans. Because of our association with you, we were reckoned as sheep to be slaughtered. We have been jointly slain on that day. On the contrary, in the thick of these things, our triumph remains beyond dispute. His love has placed us above the reach of any onslaught. This is my conviction. No threat, whether it be in death or life, be it celestial messengers, demon powers, or political principalities. Nothing known to us at this time or even in the unknown future. No dimension of any calculation in time or space, nor any device yet to be invented, has what it takes to separate us from the love of God unveiled in our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand to your feet. So there is nothing that's going to separate you unless you let it. Nothing. What is the battle you're facing now? What is the battle you're facing now? Because I want to pray for it. Is that okay? It is with a couple of you? That's good.
People are always looking for secrets and tips and tricks and life hacks. I'll give you one. Love the Lord with your whole heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. But in all things, acknowledge him. And he'll walk with you the rest of your days. You won't have to worry about one more battle. You won't have to worry about one more season in life. And it says, all the lesser things will be added unto you. All the clothes you need, all the food, all the work, all the money, all the things that you need to live this life will be added to you. Maybe just closing with God just for another minute here. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your worship and your word. We thank you that we can come together as a community, as a tribe. Even the ones watching online. I thank you that we have everything that we need. Father, we just look at these battles that are in front of us. We look at these distractions and we give them to you. Maybe you could just locate that distraction. You can look at that battle. Maybe it's not a distraction. Maybe it is a battle. Maybe it's something you're facing right now. There's a battle you're facing right now. You don't know how to get through it. You don't know how to walk through it. You don't know what to do. crying out for help. God wants to help you right now. He wants to meet you right now. If you think it's something that you can't handle and you want prayer for, I would love to pray for you. So if that's that's you, I'd love for you to come forward. I would love to pray for you now. If it's something that you can handle, I want you to look that battle straight in the face and say, you belong to the Lord. Say it out loud. You belong to the Lord. You belong to the Lord. There's power in your words. If you need a healing this morning, I would love to pray for you. Come on up. We're just gonna worship just for a couple minutes. Sometimes I see body parts. I didn't see anything like that this morning. The Lord just asked for, a, asked for me to pray for people that needed healing. Just simple. He wants, to, he wants to pour out on you. He wants to pour his healing out on you. Father, we just thank you for this time together.